Well, it is a real treat for me to be with you this morning. Over the last year or two even, I've been getting to know Jim and Kieran, and obviously I work with Lucy, who's a complete star. And I was always hoping to come and visit you one Sunday, but my plan was to kind of slink in the back, unsuspected one morning, uh, rather than come as the main speaker. But I'm still pleased to be here as the main speaker. It's a real treat. So just a few things about Tear Fund and then about me. So um, Tear Fund, yeah, I'm the head of church partnerships for Tear Fund. So I have the great privilege of working with churches all across the UK, helping them partner with our work, but also talking to them about some of their theology around poverty and justice and global issues like the environment. And also as part of my job, I have the great privilege of speaking to many networks of churches and thinking about how we input to some of their conferences and their networks and their seminars and kind of bring some thought leadership to them. So for those of you who don't know, I don't like to go into a church and presume that everybody has heard of Tear Fund and know who we are. So I'm just going to give you a really brief outline of who Tear Fund is. So um, Tear Fund is a Christian relief and development charity. We've been going for probably about 60 years now. And it's amazing how it started. Um, In the 1960s, there was a crisis in Nigeria, the Biafra crisis. And it was a humanitarian crisis. And images started flooding the TV of of famine, basically, and and people starving due to this famine in Africa. And amazingly, and I do think this is a real sense of the Holy Spirit, money just started pouring into the Evangelical Alliance simultaneously all across the UK. Churches and Christians just wanted to respond They wanted to do something, but they didn't really know how, so they started pouring money into the Evangelical Alliance. And so Tear Fund was the Evangelical Alliance Relief Fund, and that's how we started, really is the church's response to some of these issues. We still believe at Tear Fund that the church is the best place thing to change communities, nations, and the world. And so the biggest part of what we actually do globally is in training, facilitating, equipping churches in some of the poorest countries in the world. We work in about 50 of the most um, challenging countries globally. We work with about 25,000 churches at present. We really love the church. We think it's God's um, vision for changing society and the world. And our vision is to start working with about 250,000 churches. So as well as kind of um, empowering churches in different communities, we're also around um, involved in advocacy. So we speak a lot to governments and corporations about their laws that affect the most vulnerable globally. Um, we also um, respond to disasters still like we did initially. And I also, while I, want, while I was here, just wanted to thank you so much for your generosity um, as a church in responding to some of the challenges that were happening, I think it's about a year and a half ago now in Afghanistan, at Tear Fund. Um, you have a reputation amongst Tear Fund as being a generous, generous church. And we were just really, really overwhelmed at, in, in how you responded to that and your generosity as a church. So thank you so much. So a little bit more about me. As I say, I'm from Hastings. Um, I'm in a HTB plant there, and I'm part of the teaching team there. I study theology um, at Westminster Theological Centre kind of badly, but I I try and fit in some study and some essays because I think that theology is really important. It underpins what we do. Um, I know Natalie Williams. I don't know if you know of her, but she's coming to speak to you next week. She's my friend. So you have got two weeks of women from Hastings coming to speak to you as a church. Um, Me and Natalie both do a lot of work um, nationally, and we are regularly, we're both both speaking at seminars at wildfires. We're both at a different conference recently in London. And I always find it really ironic because Hastings, I don't know if you know much about Hastings, when I was a teenager, there was these tabloids that said hell on sea because it was like the worst place to live with the worst schools and the most run down, the most social problems. And I just think that God has got a massive sense of humor that actually has brought two women out of that town to actually be involved in speaking about justice and poverty and global issues. So you can all say a big hi to her from me next week. So um, it's really amazing for me to actually be in a New Frontiers church because New Frontiers is part of my heritage. I was in my teens and 20s in a New Frontiers church. I don't know how, how long you've been around in New Frontiers, but some of you may remember Stonely. Any, anyone still remember Stonely Bible Week? So I spent years as a child going to Stonely Bible Week and going to some of your leadership conferences. And um, so it was a real treat for me as I was coming here just to reflect really on the heritage that New Frontiers has had on my life. So it's a real treat. 
So I know that you as a church have been on a bit of a journey around creation care and really the biggest thing I'm do here to do is just encourage you on that journey and it's great to hear that you've got a creation care group. Now I come to you as someone who is on the journey um, but by no means slick <laughs> and I'm still learning. Um, I've been at Tier Fund for about five years and it's been a massive shift for me in my thinking and my behaviour and my mindset changing and I'm still really on that journey of change. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little story because this story probably um, highlights that you're probably more advanced than me in some ways. So probably about four or five years ago now I thought what's an easy thing for me to do? to respond to kind of climate change and consumerism and the decisions that I'm making. And I thought, I need to do some things easy that I can manage, not kind of set it so high that I can't kind of manage. So I thought an easy thing for me to do would be just to change how I buy my milk from using plastic bottles to using um, glass milk bottles. So that was quite straightforward. I was getting them delivered to my door. I felt like a complete winner. And, um, but as a single parent, um, my parents live really near me. And as a single parent, I do try travel a lot and sometimes my dad who's a complete star occasionally he comes and stays in my house while I'm away somewhere and this particular time he was staying in my house to make sure the kids were okay and, you know make sure no baddies came along all of that and um, at the early hours of the morning, I don't know if any of you get milk, milk won't come, but they seem to come ridiculously early in the morning, almost like the middle of the night, in fact. And so about three o'clock in the morning, he heard this kind of tinkling outside the front door, at which point he thought, oh my goodness, there's a burglar. A burglar's come to Becky's house. So my dad leapt up, I think probably in his underpants, ran down the stairs, found the milkman outside the front door and grabbed the milkman by the scruff of the neck, pinned him to the wall and said, what do you think you're doing here, mate? At which point the milkman kind of shakingly said, I'm just the milkman. And my dad realised the milk float behind him, realised his error, brushed him off and said, sorry, right, mate, sorry, right, mate, carry on, carry on. I kind of sheepishly went inside. So I was coming back not sure if I was going to have a lawsuit or if I would ever have milk delivered to my house again. But amazingly, I neither had a lawsuit nor um, did the milkman stop coming. So I kind of, I am learning a lot of this stuff. I'm on a journey with it, and I'm sure many of you will kind of get in less scrapes with it than I have already. Um, I'm just going to touch, obviously, on some Bible passages, and I'm just going to root some of what I'm saying today in Genesis. So I'm just going to read to you just a few verses from Genesis. I'm kind of assuming here, but if you don't know, Genesis has got some great stuff in there about the creation of the world, and I'm just going to read a little bit of it now. So Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground everything that has the breath of life in it I give I give green plant for food and it was so God saw all that it was made and it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day I just really want to start off by anchoring us in the fact that God made an awesome, awesome world. I could spend hours probably talking about creatures and wildlife and rivers and seas, but God made something that he deemed was very good. And it starts off in, in the beginning of Genesis in this amazing sense of shalom, which is a biblical word that means everything was complete, everything was whole, everything was as it should be. There was complete relationships with God and humanity and humanity and the world. But many of us know the story that those relationships actually broke down really quickly. I think by Genesis 3 and 4, they were beginning to unravel. And relationship deteriorated between God and humanity and between Adam and Eve. And then future generations, when you read Genesis, it's just again and again, it's breakdown of relationship. And the reason I just want to highlight this is because... 
at Tear Fund, when we talk about poverty, and this might surprise you, but when we define poverty, we really define it as being broken relationships. We talk about four broken relationships at Tear Fund. First and foremost, poverty is a broken relationship between us and our maker. It's also a broken relationship between us and ourselves, us and one another, and us and the world. You see, when we have a broken relationship with God, we have immense spiritual poverty because we were made to know and be in relationship with our maker. When we have um, a broken relationship with ourselves, we can feel low self-worth. We cannot understand that we were made in the image of God. When we have broken relationships with other people, it can be isolating, it can be painful, it can be lonely. And when we have a broken relationship with the world, it can look like greed, excess consumerism, and we can commodify and exploit people, even sometimes we don't mean to. And when we have, in the West, we've tended to have quite an economic-centric view of poverty. But the reality is when we frame poverty in terms of broken relationships, we have to say that we all have it. And we all have had it to varying points in different times in our life. Um, I haven't got time this morning to talk about all my brokenness. But I know that I relate to the fact that I've had a broken relationship with God, myself and other people in my own life. And when we shift our mindset on what poverty means, it does a few things. It stops us from having an us and them mentality, where we think that we have stuff and we help other people who don't have stuff. It shifts our mindset from a kind of sense of superiority, and if we're honest, sometimes arrogance, to actually a humility and a mutuality that we are all in this together, and we need to serve and help one another. And it shifts us from a position of we do for people to we do with people, listening together in collaboration. I don't know if any of you have read the book here, um, When Helping Hurts. It's something we talk quite a lot about at Tear Fund in terms of underpinning and and framing our theology. Um, But I'm going to tell you a little story from this book, just an example. It's an American book. And the story is there. There's this church in this lovely, like, middle-class suburbia, and they feel like they want to do something. They feel like they want to help who they perceive as being poor. So every Christmas, they wrap up Christmas presents, and they take them to the local estate. They knock on the door, and they give Christmas presents to these families. And um, after a while, they kind of get a bit fed up with doing this, a bit of compassion fatigue and a bit of like, actually, people aren't grateful. They're not responding how we think they should. But actually, what's going on is that when they are coming, knocking on people's doors, giving gifts, it's bringing a real sense of shame to the parents. And in the story, it says often the, the dads are kind of running out the back door because they feel embarrassed and humiliated that they are deemed as people that can't provide for their own children. And so when they're trying to help and they're trying to do something, but because their understanding of poverty is so based in economics and stuff, they don't understand that they are inadvertently down damaging relationships and people's dignity. Now, I'm not here to say we shouldn't respond because we completely should respond. And, but we should respond in a way that gives dignity and it thinks about how best to support those four broken relationships. In cases of emergencies, like that story in Afghanistan, it's right that sometimes we just pile in and we just give people food because they've got no food. But in terms of our longer-term responses, we need to have responses that don't impinge on people's self-worth and dignity as bearing the image of God. Because the truth is, and what we really talk about at Tear Fund, is God wants restoration for all of those four broken relationships. He wants that sense of Eden, that shalom, um, that sense of restoration at every level. I love listening to the stories of Jesus and reading about Jesus. And I love the way that he so often brought the kingdom with him. He prayed for the sick. He cast demons out of people. And actually what he was doing in those interactions with people that were struggling was he was restoring, again, all of those four relationships. Because many of the people he interacted with were seen as too impure to enter the temple. And they were outsiders of the religious institutions. And so in engaging with them, he restored their relationship with God. But also he restored their relationship with himself by bringing physical healing, by bringing spiritual release of the demonic. Um, He 
often we read these stories and people go from being downcast and rejected to feeling complete joy that Jesus has transformed their life holistically. And also, he also restores their relationship to the others. But instead of being outside and excluded from communities, he removes the obstacles that, rem- that excludes them from community. And so a kingdom response, a Jesus response to poverty is holistic, it's inclusive, it's restorative, and it gives people dignity. And that theology of poverty underpins all of our work. Um, I had the great privilege um, last year of being in Rwanda to meet a lot of the churches that we partner with and work with in Rwanda, and I had some incredible stories. I don't have time to share all of them with you today. But I'm going to read one story, and as I'm reading this one story, I want you to just think about the restoration that's done in all of those relationships. This is a lady called Clements. And this is translated, so I'm going to read it. It's actually in her own words, but we've translated it into English. And she talks about joining a group. This is like a small group through the church. And often the small groups in the churches we work with also become self-help groups in supporting people with businesses as well. So she says, before joining this group, I was hopeless because I had nothing to do. I knocked at doors to ask for small jobs, and it was hard to find food for my children. My husband had left me and I was experiencing a hard and bad life. The group, this is from the local church, were my neighbours. And they came and visited me and told me about the hope there is in Jesus. They invited me to church. They clothed me. They came to my house after a flood and the church came and helped me rebuild it. Really, I don't know how this pastor and this church loved me. I live in a high-risk area of mud flies, and when it rains, they came to help rebuild my house. It was like God was visiting me. When I grew up, I was an orphan. This is really common in Rwanda because of the genocide. But now I feel like I have a family. From the Bible studies, I heard that God is love, and I've seen that in this church. They gave me rice. I didn't know there was love in people, but when I came here, I found there was love here. They talked to me about how to support myself and, tra- and training I could do. And I started asking with asking for a small loan. I created a small business of selling fruits. And now I can feed my children, pay for school materials and provide their basic needs. The church made my heart joyful. I used to be very sad, but now I'm joyful. And that kind of story we hear again and again and again, where we're not just looking to see people's economic needs change, we're also wanting to see restoration with God, restoration and dignity in who God's made them to be, and part of a community. So how does this theology of broken relationships lead to creation care? Because that's a bit of a foundation. But as a world, we are increasingly, even over the last sort of 40, 50 years, living individualistic lifestyles that are actually damaging other people and creating brokenness and broken relationships. We know that we live in a culture where there is excessive consumerism. We keep talking about the challenges of climate change, and we know that pollution is a global problem. I'm going to tell you a few things from a report that we did at Tear Fund. Um, Recently, we've done some research, and the statistics have come out that 2 billion people in the world's poorest communities are living and working amongst piles of waste because they don't have their rubbish collected. That's a quarter of the world's population that don't have waste collection. And the people we see in the communities we work with, they have no choice to either burn it, which produces toxic fumes, or just to throw it in waterways or to live amongst it. They're breathing toxic air, they're drinking polluted water, and they're battling sickness. And the research that we did showed that a million people every year are dying from pollution due to waste. That's one person every 30 seconds. This is a massive problem of broken relationships in our world. I'm going to tell you another story from Diane, who's from Brazil. 
Um, it says that she lives with her sister and husband and their children in Raikai, Brazil. Brazil. She says, it only has to rain and everything floods. A lot of rubbish comes down the river, which I, what I see most are water bottles and fizzy drinks, the types of bottles that are not returnable. Plastic waste such as this creates a breeding ground for disease carrying mosquitoes and blocks waterways and drains, which causes flooding. She says, when it floods, everyone gets sick. She said, just this week, I had to help my daughter. I won't get into the graphics, but who was very sick. She said, the problem, another problem is rats. This creates many rats. And she says, I get down, but there is nothing I can do about this because I have nowhere else to go. Now, some of these problems can seem like a problem that's far away and not really our problem. But in a global economy where products are produced and consumed globally, actually, we are involved. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the film Amazing Grace. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Um, it's one of my favorite films. I find it really inspiring. Um, but the story is there of slavery and the abolition of slavery and how Will William Wilberforce was kind of key in speaking to governments about that story. I really encourage you to watch it. Um, but what really strikes me is that people began to realize that the things they were consuming, for example, sugar, they were beginning to realize that what they were consuming in their homes on their tables actually had a global backstory. And the global backstory was pretty horrendous. People were being brutally exploited. People were dying. People were being forced into slavery. And they suddenly had this penny drop moment where they realized that what they were doing and what they were consuming was consuming was affecting people that although they'd never met, it was pretty barbaric what was going on. And they began to join the dots between their consumerism and, the, and um, exploitation. And what began to happen on this was a number of things. But one of the things that happened was individuals began to change their consuming habits. People started giving up sugar. Like, if this is the story of how we get sugar, then we don't want any part in it. We don't want sugar. And also, there was conversations with governments and with companies. And there began to be this movement, which actually was pioneered by Christians, saying, we don't want this injustice. We don't want this on our watch. And we know when we look back at history that we as Christians were on the right side of history, campaigning, speaking up, making lifestyle choices where we knew there was barbaric injustice about through anybody who was made in God's image and God's people. And Christians were forerunners of overturning global injustice. We have to begin to join the dots that actually... There are similarities in that story for us as we discover injustices in our supply chains and in our consumerism. And one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, when we look back at history, will as Christians we be on the right side of history in being some of the first to speak into this inju these injustices? I love, um, I love the prophets. I love Isaiah. I think partly it's because it's in the middle of the Bible and I always open it there. Um, but I love the way the prophets call out stuff. They call out injustice. They call out how God's people are looking after the vulnerable and the poor. And there's this one particular, many of you may be familiar with it in Isaiah 58, where God's people are doing religious activity and they're worshipping and they're doing all the religious stuff. Um, but actually, they're exploiting their workers. And it says in Isaiah 58, verse 3, On the day of fasting, you do as you please, and you exploit your workers. And then through, through, um, God speaks through Isaiah, saying, Is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn your, away from your own flesh and blood. The call throughout the whole of scripture is that actually worshipping and being pleasing to God and following him goes hand in hand with this sense of justice and not exploiting people and calling out for the most vulnerable. A friend of mine is a curate. And we often have these kind of conversations. I ended up on the train with him recently. We had a long train journey. And he said to me that he'd been really stirred about some of these issues. So he went to his PCC and just said, I feel like as a church we should do something. Like I don't quite know where we begin. We could begin with eco-church. We could begin with thinking about what we consume. He goes, but I, I want us to do something. So he went to the PCC and he shared this vision. Like I think as a church that we can take a stand on this. We can make some different decisions about this. And the PCC said to him, you know what, that's great, 
But we're really only interested in seeing converts for Jesus. And so because we're only interested in seeing converts for Jesus, we're not going to get involved in this. And he left really despondent. And we really need to be careful as Christians that we don't separate justice from what, who God is, what his character is, and what his heart is for our communities, our nations, and globally. So in the UK, again, this is studies, and we can share these with you as a church, we throw away every minute enough plastic every minute to fill up four double-decker buses. And this is single-use plastic that we use once, we discard, and it just stays somewhere on the planet for about four to 500 years. The excess use of plastic is actually relatively recent. If you look back in the whole of history, even in the last decades, this has really ramped up. Um, my nan, she died a few years ago now, but I still remember when I was young that she'd knit our jumpers, she'd bake our cakes, she'd go to the greengrocer and the butcher and meat would be on Sundays, hooray! And she lived actually quite a simple life. And I don't like to think of myself as that old, but um, when I was a kid, we all had hand-me-downs, we shared our clothes, um, we had Coca-Cola in glass bottles, and we thought we were so cool. And um, there was also, in Hastings, there was a toy hospital, so when your toys broke, you took them to the hospital to get them mended. And I remember, probably in the 80s, I remember kind of like water bottles becoming a thing, and I was just thinking... That is the most bonkers thing I've ever heard in my whole life when you can get water out of a tap. That will never take on. Clearly, I was wrong. But actually, it's only within the last few generations that we use the amount of single-use plastic that we do, and actually we consume the vast amounts that we do. Now, I'm not here to tell you not to use your washing machine, your dishwasher, your fridges. There's been some great inventions <laughs> over the last 20 or 30 years, and I am the first in line to be using those. And good things have come from it, too. But the reality is that our consumer culture, we're just using way too much stuff. And we're not thinking about who made it. We're not thinking about what happens when we've done with it. And we're not really thinking about sort of the global consequences of what we're consuming. The other big issue with our consumer culture is it really communicates that we should base our identity on what we acquire and what we have, and we should judge ourselves and compete with other people based on what we have. And it tells us that our worth as human beings is in what we consume and what we own. Now, as children of God, there are massive issues of this in terms of we want our identity to be as children of God, knowing that he is our father, that he provides for us, that he takes care of us. It also just disconnects us from other people, people who are God's creation. And God has a vision for those people as image bearers. Now, this is, and I'm not here to tell you we should all dress the same or have nothing. Um, God created us with diversity and colour and individual choices. Um, I got some second-hand chairs yesterday off a Facebook selling page. I love them. They're really retro. They look so cool. I'm so happy. We, we, we can still be ourselves and have things that we like and don't like. But we have to just think about the amount of stuff we're consuming and some of the stories of those. And we want to make sure that our identity isn't wrapped up in the things that our culture's identity is wrapped up in. So we have a decision when we consume to think about how things are made, who made it, do they have a proper wage, have they been treated well, what impact does it have on the environment, or what impact does it have if I use something once and then I'm never going to use it again, and it's going to stay on the planet. So I know we can't answer this on every single thing we buy, but as much as we are possible and able, we need to consume as, responsibility, as responsibly as we can. And actually, satisfaction in our lives comes from gratitude and being grateful for what we've got, being grateful for what God's given us. Um, I've got some decking outside my house. It really does need replacing. It's a little bit like, you know, old now and a bit rough around the edges. And I was sitting there having a cup of tea the other day thinking, oh, I really need to find the money for this decking. And I was thinking, but what if I have a different mindset? It's not kind of broken yet. It's a bit scruffy. What if I just go, thank you, God, I can sit in my garden, have my cup of tea with my decking. And so often, actually, we have to have that discipline of kind of changing our mindset. Otherwise, we're always like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? So in terms of just plastic, um, it says that between 2000 
and 2019 plastic generation has more than doubled in that last decade. And most plastic is designed to be single use. As I've mentioned before, it is polluting drink water. It is creating issues for people with flooding. So a recent research that we did said that 218 million people are at risk of more frequent and more severe flooding due to plastic pollution. That's equivalent of the UK, France and Germany combined. All of those people are at risk of more flooding simply because their waterways are blocked. You know, when I was a teenager, I was quite frustrated because I always used to look at the church and go, why don't we do more stuff in the local community? Why are we always inside when the people that need to know Jesus are outside? And not just because of me, but it's amazing that in 20 years, actually, as churches across the UK, we're really good at local social action. We're really good at thinking about how we um, engage with our communities. But I have a 19-year-old and a 16-year-old, and it really interests me what they're passionate about. And they are really passionate about global issues. They're concerned about the planet. They want churches to do more. We did a report on this in Tear Fund, which you can find online, called Burning Down the House. We found that nine out of ten young people asked were concerned about global issues like climate change. But only one out of ten of those people thought the church was doing enough to respond and engage with it. So this is a concern for our, our younger generation, and they really want to see us speak about it, change about it, and be involved in some of the action around it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can respond in different ways and some of the things that are going on. Um, we can respond to this at every level. At the moment, last week, my colleagues were in Paris. I don't know if you know much what was going on, but basically, over this year and next year, about 200 world governments are coming together to create the first ever plastics treaty because there's been global recognition the amount of plastics we're using is not working for the world. And so there are agreements, they're, they're, they're talking about it, they're researching about it, and they're thinking about what can be, what can be agreed on this together. They're recognizing this is a global problem. Um, also, how we respond as churches, uh, both in the UK but and overseas. We work with a church in Brazil. It's the, ch it's the church I just told you the story from. And in this story, I don't know if I'm saying the name right, Rycliffe, Brazil, um, in this city, flooding is becoming more and more and more frequent. And it's because of unpredictable and heavy rains, but it's also because of waste in the river. And this church decided that they were going to try and engage with the problem, and they were going to see what they could do about it. And I'm just going to read you a few of the things the church is doing, because I just think the church is so amazing when it rolls up its sleeves and it engages in things. So they've been organising as a church community waste picking. So as a church, they've been going out trying to clear up the waste from their own environment. They've been petitioning the local government, asking them to clean the river. They hold regular community meetings to discuss waste and flooding issues, which has created to a public hearing of their demands. They're becoming a zero waste church and they're educating others to help change the culture in the whole city. They run disaster preparation training so people know what to do when a flood happens. And they fully trained a flood brigade, brigade, brigade to respond. And in May last year, when floods and landslides caused devastation, the flood brigade rescued 420 people who were trapped in their homes. The church sheltered 80 people on their top floor. They supported 2,000 families who'd lost everything in the flood. And they set up a field hospital with 33 health workers to help for people's physical and mental health needs. This is a church that is seeing the problems in its local community and just thought, what do we do to become part of the solution? What do we do to bring change to our city and to challenge governments and to help people? So this, it's amazing what churches all around the world do. There's another thing that's going on. Many organisations, I would say that Tear Fund are probably on the front foot of this, is one of the leading Christian organisations and probably secular organisations speaking into this. A number of years ago, we had a rubbish campaign where we got as many Christians as we can to sign a petition where we were petitioning Coca-Cola, Unilever, PepsiCo, and then one other I always forget, um, to change some of their behaviours around just keep producing all of this plastic waste. We are now doing our kind of second version of that where we're talking to governments and we're asking them to create legally binding targets to reduce plastic production. We're asking for universal access to waste plastic 
um, production to reduce the amount of waste. Um, we're asking for the support for waste pickers who are really vulnerable and not paid very well, that are working in this rubbish. And we're asking that governments be held to account and businesses held to account to take real action. So supporting um, petitions, organisations that are speaking to this, putting your name, like you can all go and look on the Tier Fund site and look at action and you can all just sign a petition, which is like we stand together as Christians. We use our voice together because when we stand together, we have a powerful voice into laws globally and in our own nation. And we can also do things ourselves. Like I said, I try to give up. Um, <laughs> I'm using a lot less plastic and I am using milk bottles. And no one's been arrested so far. But we can think about how do we respond as Christians? What can we give up? What can we change? What easy wins can we do as individuals in our, in our households, in our families, in our churches, in our communities? Wouldn't it be amazing if, again, the church was the leading voice in our nation and in the world for advocating for the most vulnerable? Wouldn't it be amazing if we all made small changes in our lifestyle and in doing so we participated in global social change? Wouldn't it be amazing, again, if the church was on the right side of history in being on the forefront of fighting for global justice? So earlier on, we sang, didn't we, about this is who you are. We know God is a beautiful creator. We know he cares for the vulnerable. We know that Jesus came to bring holistic change to people's lives. This is who our God is. And so this morning, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. And I just want to encourage you to keep going. I know sometimes it feels a bit against the grain and we have to change our thinking. But I want to thank you for participating and exploring how you individually and as a church respond to some of these global injustices. Thank you.